So any Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of VCTV. I'm your host, Kyle Ellicott, and we are here to talk about everything commerce, whether it's e-commerce or it's customer-based products. We are here to talk about everything, real-time, physical, digital, you name it. We're going to be talking about how things have changed and will continue to change around the purchases that we make and how we find products as well, or how products are found for us. Um, but before we dive deep into this topic, uh, a quick thank you to you, our audience, for tuning in. If you're liking what you hear today, make sure you click subscribe and check out the archive on latoken.com uh, for all of the speakers of the VCTV family and all those that we bring from around the world to share with you their thoughts and insights and on the ground perspective of different technologies, industries, and regions around the world. If you'd like to be an investor to share your thoughts, or as an entrepreneur to pitch us your company or product and service to get real-time feedback, do reach out to the team and or myself and we'll find the right spot for you. Speaking of team, a big thank you to the LaToken team and to Maria and Hasmik and everyone else who brings us together on the team to make VCTV possible for you every day, all day for all regions around the world. With that, I'm your host, Kyle. Let's go ahead and jump in and introduce today's investor guests who are joining us to share their thoughts and insights around the ever-evolving landscape of commerce. Uh, Joel, welcome back to the show. A little intro, a little background for everybody. Yeah, very, very quickly. Uh, uh, I'm primarily involved in the hospitality sector. However, I was involved with the beginning of DirecTV, with the first purchases on live TV through the DirecTV systems. Um, currently, I'm deeply involved in virtual brands, in food tech, and all things related to retail, hospitality, and F&B consumer. So happy to be here. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Joel. And excited to dive into retail and how that has been reshaped, even more so with hospitality uh, here as we dive into this topic in just a moment. But uh, Gary, welcome back to the show as well. A little intro, a little background. It's been a while, Kyle. I feel like I'm here <laughs> forever, you know. <laughs> it's amazing. Anyhow, my name's Gary Fowler. And I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've done 17 companies. In fact, I started one of the first global e-commerce consulting companies uh, many years ago when they said it wouldn't work and they said people weren't going to buy things online. So been around, uh, done 17 companies. I've been involved in two unicorns. I was on the original management team, a click software that was sold to Salesforce for $1.35 billion. I also started Eva.ai, an AI HR tech company. And also now I am the CEO, president, and co-founder of GSD Venture Studios, a premier AI venture studio and quantum located in Silicon Valley. We curate companies from around the world and help them go global. And I'm excited today, Kyle, to be involved in this uh, panel and look forward to the conversations. It's a hot topic and it's a great time to be in e-commerce. Wonderful. Thank you, Gary and Joel. Welcome both. Uh, diving right in, and Gary, you, you touched on it. I mean, this is a hot topic. Over the last 12 months, we've seen an aggressive amount of demand, um, some forced and some other just out of convenience around e-commerce and the power that it can bring. Also have seen a number of uh, hiccups during the growth of e-commerce. Uh, we've seen platforms like SD and Shopify and many others really rise to the occasion. We're starting to see more live streaming uh, opportunities of showcasing products and opportunities to purchase. We're seeing more influence or influencers uh, helping to share and, and get knowledge out about certain project or products as well. We're seeing data leveraged more than ever to put products in front of us that we never thought we needed, but all of a sudden we're buying. Um, but before I go any further, I'd love to hear both of you and your thoughts as to how the e-commerce landscape has really changed. And Joel, I want to start with you. I mean, you coming from your past at DirecTV, you were working on a number of initiatives and kind of really future forward uh, technologies or services come full circle from that to where we are today. How has this landscape evolved uh, pretty dramatically from those days to now where e-commerce is now? Well, I mean, honestly, DirecTV now is a dinosaur and mm -hmm. uh, I don't see DirecTV <laughs> uh, surviving long term because once internet TV came, came in and streaming became the norm, then the really need for satellite broadcasting, I think, other than in areas where the internet is very weak in rural areas, whatever, I, I'm not sure there's a need for a direct TV 
you know, anymore. You know, I, um, I lived in Hong Kong for many years and I had internet streaming uh, more than 10 years ago where there was, you know, in Hong Kong, there's very little cable. So everyone was using PCCW uh, internet streaming for TV and whatever. So I've seen that kind of the head of the curve in the US. But yes, DirecTV, because of the original digitization of programming, we used to get the cable signals and then broadcast it um, through satellites. That was the start of giving people 200 channels. But the problem was there was nothing to watch. And I think that problem still exists with, uh, you know, with having 200, 300 channels. But, you know, there's still uh, there seems to be an insatiable appetite for all of these streaming services. But at the end of the day, I still my wife and I still have trouble finding something to watch. So, so I, I see it moving from, you know, satellite broadcasting. You know, it was originally analog, then it's digital. Now it's moved to the Internet because of the, the bandwidth that's available to do that. It wasn't available back in 1996, 98. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a good point. I mean, we've seen a number of these initiatives and even going back to your mention of Hong Kong and we'll just uh, bucket uh, Asia as a whole, you know, Alibaba had a number of initiatives and we've seen their, um, their services that they've provided on something like Singles Day, so November 11th uh, uh, every year, for instance. Yeah, and they, they, the way that they stream it, they also have live events such as fashion mm -hmm. shows where in real time, as you're seeing people walk down the catwalk, you're actually being shown the products that they're wearing and have the chance to buy those products in real time. Absolutely. We were talking a little bit about show. I mean, is this something you see, Joel, as a, as a rising trend or really something that we're going to be living with here in the coming years? Yes, absolutely. We tried to do that back in 96 with fashion TV mm -hmm. in Asia. <laughs> so, but the, the need for it, the demand, you know, people could have clicked on their device through the IRD back in the mid 90s and buy that stuff as well. It never worked back then because the behavior, uh, it, the behavior wasn't adapted enough to be able to do that. But um, this day and age, I see a lot of that happening more and more, uh, obviously. Yeah. And I, I see it happening through live streaming, whether it's cable or internet streaming. Yes, I see lots of goods and services being bought that, in that method, but it's not, an, it's not a new idea. It's just easier to implement now because of bandwidth. Well, bandwidth and products, right? There's many more platforms, many more services that make this integration for the everyday person versus just corporations to be able to do it, do this in real time, right? Yeah, the remember three of us remember one thing, Alibaba, the big benefit of Alibaba in China is how many million individual entrepreneurs went into business because of Alibaba. You mm -hmm. know, people in small rural areas producing goods, putting them on. I mean, that's the real, and it, was a, it was a huge win for small business in China. Absolutely. And also created a, a really future forward, uh, hyper localized uh, supply chain effort as well. Right. So we were talking, yeah. you order something and instead of getting it in a week, it, you know, move to a few days to a few hours or in some cases less than an hour, uh, as we've seen with Alibaba, JD and Taobao and a, a number of others right. in the region. Well, I think your I think um, your viewers would be fascinated with a brand. I don't want to talk too much, but there's a, a group called uh, Mobile World in Vietnam that I've known for years when they had three stores. I was involved with a private equity fund that invested in them. Mobile World inst uh, instead went from three stores to 3,000 stores, went public on the Vietnam market. The PE I was involved in got 60 times their investment. And they will deliver anything, including refrigerators, phones, within 30 minutes. So wow. if you want a refrigerator, it'll be at your door. In th well, with 3,000 stores yeah. <laughs> and depots, they can do it. So I, I think that just blew me away that you can buy a refrigerator in 30 minutes. I just, I thought they were joking until they said, no, we're not joking. Yeah. You want an air you conditioner, do. it'll be there in 30 minutes. So that's, right. the, and this is, this is an emerging market. Okay. This isn't the United States or Germany. This is right. per capita income of $4,000 a year. It, it redefines just in time, right? Just in time inventory or the entire process of just in time throughout a value chain. It completely right. redefined it. Um, and, and I say, redefined it because that is what's starting to happen on a global level. We're starting to see those supply chains move into a more hyper-localized position and a more uh, faster uh, delivery time, leveraging more distribution centers, as you mentioned, uh, Joel, as well in your example. And uh, Gary, I want to come to you around the same question. I mean, over the last decade, you've been involved not just in artificial intelligence, but many companies and also those uh, that may be you know, prominent brands being sold uh, through e-commerce. How have you seen the industry really reshape over the last decade and more importantly over the last year? Yeah. So, I mean, it, it used to be flat, Kyle, where you would go online, find a product and order the product. 
the intuitiveness, the artificial intelligence to be able to, to look at your buying patterns, look at the social media, figure out the kind of things that you want, things that you've looked at and start to present those to you. That has dramatically shifted. So really to predict the kind of things that you look at what you've looked at, but then also predict the kind of things that you want. The other thing is which do, uh, changes really the hyper personalization. And so uh, additive experiences like adding video, video has a big uptick in terms of purchase. So if a video is attached, explaining what the product does or a review of that product has a dramatic uh, impact on whether or not you're going to purchase. Understanding, for instance, if you've left your shopping cart and not, and in fact, I just got it from one of the, from one of the uh, companies uh, today. They actually, ha I had gone into their website and put something in a cart and uh, I just wanted to see what would go in the cart. I wasn't sure if I could purchase it. And of course it did. And um, so having that situation to follow up with you, if you do look for something to be able to bring it to you to take a look at it, it's, it's pretty interesting. So we've changed, you know, when I, for, I started the first e com one of the first e-commerce consulting companies, people mm -hmm. said nobody would do it and that it was not something that, uh, that was safe, et cetera. This is back in the late nineties. And I remember back then it's a guy by the name of Piong Chen who started broad vision was an original, one of the original investors in Siebel, um, met, uh, Ufida, Sina in China, et cetera. But he said, this is a $30 billion cottage industry and people were laughing. And then it started to change and look at how it's changed. Look at uh, airlines in terms of buying tickets, look at Priceline in terms of, you know, hotel rooms. It used to be you called up on the phone, talked to a hotel chain, got a price and you never got any kind of deals. Now look at it. You can compare, you can contrast, and you have things presented to you. So our whole idea, this whole customized, hyper-personalized experience, I mean, it's getting better and better and better. And so as we go down through and it understands in two weeks when we would take a vacation or a month uh, or six months from now and starts to present us with opportunities, that's when it starts getting very, very exciting. The other thing is think about having product placement, being able to take a product and put it inside a video. So the kind of video that you like with that particular product installed and the kind of subliminal suggestions, how that's going to affect. And, and I, we talked there earlier in the show about having a, a fashion show, for instance, and be able to click or a movie, click on that particular item and order it. We weren't ready uh, 15, 20 years ago. We just hadn't adapted to this digital transformation and new reality, but we have now and people are willing uh, and able to go out and purchase those products, they feel more comfortable with the media. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a that's a great point. And um, you know, Joel, I want to come back to you on that around hospitality. As Gary mentioned, a few few companies in that space, whether it be Booking.com or Priceline or a few others. Um, how has hospitality and retail, or maybe let's separate those? How has hospitality really been reshaped by uh, consumers and the power of e-commerce? Uh, in your experience, well, plus plus a negative for the industry. Obviously, the, the 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 negative for the industry is people are more careful buyers, and hotels aren't able to charge the same higher prices they could get away with before because consumers can shop. So, from a consumer standpoint, it's a complete win. From mm -hmm. a hospitality standpoint, it's a mixed bag. I think, um, you know, because of margins eroding, because people can look at special deals that or, ordinarily they would get higher prices for. So, you know, it's a buyer's market uh, mm -hmm. with with uh, with air airlines. Obviously, the prices change daily, monthly. I mean, start, excuse me, uh, daily or even by the hour. And that's as a consumer, it just makes you be a lot more do your own due diligence to make sure you're actually getting a price that is reasonable. Because, you know, I could book a flight from L.A. to London one day. It could be three thousand dollars. The next day it's eighteen hundred. And two days later, it's four thousand. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, playing with consumer, playing with the time of the year, playing with the hour, I guess, playing with the day, uh, prices change, you know, incredibly dramatically. I, I think one of the things I'm hoping for is drugs, drug pricing, 
will be able to benefit from this kind of, re of, of revolution. I mean, it's just insane to buy a, a generic drug with your insurance, it's $5. If you buy it at CVS or Walgreens without insurance, it's $60. If you go on GoodRx, it's $22. <laughs> it's like a casino for, for you know, life-saving drugs. <laughs> so that's an industry like real estate, which would seem to be ripe for <laughs> you know, a lot more transparency and clarity through you know, digitization. Yeah. And so, so going into retail and maybe a little bit of food and beverage, mm -hmm. but really retail, I mean, how has that been reshaped in your mind right. with the last year and the big focus on e-commerce? How does that reshape retail uh, for the year ahead or maybe even the next couple of years right. ahead? Well, I, let me address it to the United States because, you know, it's other markets I deal with internationally have a little different situation. The United States is over retailed and has too much property, too many retail stores, too many restaurants, and too much excess capacity. So uh, the beautiful thing about the world we're living in now is there are ways for restaurant owners, retailers to take advantage of their excess capacity, particularly in the restaurant space or even the hospital commissary space or the, the restaurant space in hotels. And lots of people are marketing either virtual brands or well-known brands through host kitchens to be able to raise the efficiency of a lot of these back of the house kitchens. Now, some of it will work and some of it won't. Obviously using well-known brands like a Chick-fil-A will have a hell of a, a big difference in sales than, uh, you know, than Joel's hot dogs. But mm -hmm. I think it's right now it's in uh, the process of trial and error, but um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of it because it relieves excess capacity. You know, in the hospitality industry, which is a huge problem at the moment. That's a that's a great point. I mean, it's we're seeing a number of those host or ghost kitchens or open kitchens, if you will, uh, that are being leveraged from the food and beverage industry, where it's shared resources, new brands instantly popping up, hitting on to something like Uber or Uber Eats. Part of me. DoorDash and other uh, services here in the States uh, and instantly becoming a brand that you can buy from uh, as well, right? A diversified menu from maybe a menu that already exists uh, as well. Um, well. We're also involved with a group. There's a group called Franklin Junction, which are a restaurant uh, private equity fund that owns a lot of restaurant groups. And they're, they're like the match.com for host kitchens. So they match um, you know, host kitchens with brands. So obviously running a platform is still the best way to monetize a business. I mean, I'd much rather own and run a platform than start building restaurants or cooking food. Right. Well, and speaking of platforms, I want to switch gears over to uh, what is a rising trend we've seen over the past few years, more in Asia, a uh, number of companies that have become very successful and, and big uh, in the region. Now we're starting to see this as a trend here in the US and a little bit of Europe, and that's group buying. And the idea that you can put together a group and together as a group, you get a discount on a given product. Um, you know, Joel and then Gary, I want to come to you as well. Is do you see this group buying uh, really as a lifelong trend or something that's just in the moment where the three of us can decide we both all want to buy the same product? And because the three of us come together in a group, we actually get a slight discount or anonymously we have come together as a group and all want to buy the same product and again, therefore get the discount. Do you see that as something that uh, will continue, uh, Joel, uh, not just maybe in Asia and the US, but globally? Yeah, because in, in Asia, the Japanese are already doing it, but they're doing it in an analog way. In, in other mm -hmm. words, four families get together because they have small homes and one family drives to Costco <laughs> and buys, you know, buys a giant ream of toilet paper and they can't fit it in their garage, so they split it up. So I, I mean, that, that in Asia is quite a, a trend because of people live in very small apartments, don't have garages, don't have big refrigerators. So they have to buy and, you know, whatever they buy, they split it up. So at least from a, from a retail perspective, I see a lot of that happening in Asia. And, and Gary, same question to you. I mean, do you see this group purchasing and group dis discounts because of those group purchases um, being something that we're going to continue to see here in the near future on physical goods and, and hopefully digital goods as well as we start to move into those digital marketplaces? You know, Kyle, I grew up in the country. We had these a long time ago. They called them co-ops. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, so it's some. It's not like it changed. We we <laughs> did it for a long time, and those buying co-ops were out there. So. I mean, yes, it's a great opportunity to leverage the power of, you know, many people to be able to get the right kind of pricing, you know, and Joel's right in terms of 
uh, the situation today, if you are in some limited space and you mm -hmm. want to buy a, a ream of toilet paper or a, 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 a giant pack, and I've got about 10 of them in my garage right now, <laughs> uh, because of you, Kyle, because you got me a little afraid that there's going to be a toilet paper shortage again. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, it's, you know, absolutely. I mean, the situation is, it's just, it's a little bit more delicate because if you got five families or 10, how do you split it up? And the logistics around doing that, how much time is it going to take to split that, um, that up? So I think it could, it could be interesting. I'm not sure if the U.S. is really ready for it today because we got Costco, right? We've got, and it's so real quick, let me, I want to jump in. I, I think maybe my question was misunderstood. So it's not three people going in and buying a, a pallet of toilet paper and that being divided up by three, it's three people. So the three of us going in to buy the same product and each of us getting that product individually, uh, but at a lower cost. So because instead of me walking in to buy the pallet for $10, I bring two friends, the two of you, we actually now get it at a discount, say $8 each as well. This is a, a, a new platform or many platforms that exist that are doing this. So it's group buying with group discounts. Or, or yeah, I mean, if you're doing it at the point of purchase, that's one thing. If you're doing it after the purchase, that's an entirely different issue. At purchase, sorry. Yeah, so we come in together because we all want the same light. We all want the same product, whatever right. it may be. Yeah. We then get a discount on that. I mean, that's a, you know, we do that now. I mean, I do that with my friends now. If we're, we're going out, we want uh, whatever, tennis rackets or whatever, we'll go in and get deals cut. I mean, we do it informally now. So, yes, it could be an interesting opportunity. Absolutely. Well, I think we call it refer a friend. I mean, there are a lot of platforms I'm on. If you were a friend, you get 10 or 20% off on your next purchase. Exactly. I see that all the time. So that's kind of an old-fashioned way of, of doing what you were talking about, Kyle, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. We're now starting to see that as an aggregate where people are pooled together, either known or not known. And because of that, say again, 30 people want to buy the same product. So the company actually loses a little margin uh, and offers it a discount to sell to 30 people versus maybe right. none or one uh, as well. So, um, but uh, switching gears around um, uh, QVC, Amazon, these in stream, these digital uh, streaming networks that have popped up. Uh, are you seeing these as the next future when it comes to buying goods? I mean, instead of going on uh, again to a, or going to a retail store or going online, we're watching these streams and seeing products and buying products right away or being served products uh, through the digital uh, viewing that we're doing. And Joel, I'll start with you on that. Well, it has been happening before. It's just, I mean, bandwidth creates a different way of doing it. But I think one of the things I wanted to bring up is, look, I think there's, there's, too much capacity in the system, whether it's food or apparel or whatever. And system, platforms that soak up, whether it's too many, uh, too many Brooks Brothers sweaters still sitting there that can't be sold, or too much broccoli in a distributorship, platforms that can soak up that capacity and find uh, a consumer for it, I think are going to do incredibly well. And that problem has not been solved yet. I mean, I'm working with a group in India that has a platform that matches food producers with food distributors, retailers, and restaurants. And is like an auction shop for somebody that has too few, too many potatoes, or too much broccoli, or too much whatever, and finds a home for it nearby on the platform. I think that's soaking up excess capacity and making the whole supply chain more, more um, efficient. And I, I think that's the future. I mean, clearly, yeah. using that's blockchain most likely. But I mean, that is. I mean, we throw away so much food in this country, and I have no idea what happens to all these returns. You know, in Asia, you can't return anything. You know, if you go into a store and you say, I want to return my sweater, they say, sorry. Mm -hmm. You know, the U.S., uh, any foreigner who moves to the U.S. is shocked that they can return everything practically. You know, I mean, I wonder what they do with all that stuff. You know, so there, obviously there's a need like B stock and others that are buying all this crap up and reselling it, right? Well, and there's also secondhand marketplaces too. We're starting right. to see more activity in that, um, whether it be goods uh, like uh, those that you were mentioning or also clothing and food is a little bit different enough, obviously, but uh, when it comes to uh, consumer goods, we are seeing secondary marketplaces being utilized more uh, on a digital platform base uh, more than ever. And you mentioned blockchain, uh, and I would love to hear, Gary, your opinion on where other technologies such as blockchain, maybe AI and others will be playing a role in the future of commerce as uh, we continue to look at this digital decade in front of us uh, as technology plays a bigger role in our lives. 
I mean, this, you know, so the situation is, it's again, it's about having the right product, the right place at the right time, but really forecasting what kind of products that you're going to want. And I, I don't know if you're you're like me, but the when I'm out there surfing on the internet now, I get many times if I'm in Facebook or in all kinds of different places, uh, I'm getting uh, ads coming to me for products that, quite frankly, I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. And I like it. And so, you know, there's so much data around us. We've talked about it many times, Kyle, but there's mm -hmm. so much data around it, it's hard to make decisions. And it's even, you know, sometimes I just was uh, looking for a part for my uh, SUV and I wanted a reinforcement bumper. Not such an easy thing to find. And so I did find it. And then I forgot where I had found it because I looked at so many websites and junkyards. <laughs> Honestly, it's like I'm looking all around. I'm like, where was it? Where did I see it? And then what happens in Facebook, it pops up from that location at that price. And I bought it. Hmm. So we're inundated with information. It's just like you were saying earlier about, you know, think about it, even like Netflix. We get bombarded with so many different videos. It's really hard to figure out what to watch. I don't know if you're like me, but, you know, from buying the, you know, buying uh, the or renting those streaming videos or viewing them under Prime, it's in, it's almost impossible to figure out something. So imagine having uh choices that are really hyper personalized for you. You like action adventure. You like uh female or male stars, you like um, jungle scenes, you know, start to be able to throw things to us that are really personalized for us. And in terms of purchasing, that's going to happen because we can really forecast what somebody wants out in time with some degree of accuracy today. And the more data, the more information that's around us. And, you know, Kyle, we've talked about it, right? There's 40 zettabytes of data in the world today. That number is enough. The CDs stacked up going to the moon 29 times uh, and grows at 66% per year. So we're inundated with information. Anything that's out there that makes our lives better, I think what we need is we need intelligent assistants that really help us guide our lives like guardian angels. Essentially, mm -hmm. these are the kind of things we should get. This is where they're located. So we don't have to spend all the time going out and searching. It's really presented to us to make our lives a lot easier because as we go forward three to five years from now, it's going to be impossible without having those type of systems, those intelligent assistants in place to be really help us choose and, and guide our guide the way that we should live guide in terms of the, the things that could be interesting for us to buy, giving us the freedom of choice, but really presenting them to us in a very limited fashion. That's interesting for us. Yeah, you're a great. It's a great point, Joel. I, coming to you, I mean, working in a few different areas that we've been speaking about, other technologies aside from blockchain or areas of opportunity you'd like to see really take form uh, into the hospitality, retail, and food industries uh, to help them go into this next uh, decade in front of us. Well, the thing, the thing I want, the, the, there are two things that I want the most because I think it's good for everybody. It's not good for banks, but it's good for everybody else. Is I want to see true. Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, Chinese style cashless payments mm -hmm. where merchants are paying 10 or 20 cents a transaction, not 2.5%, where people are pay basically using their smartphone to pay for pretty much everything and uh, get rid of all those efficiencies that banks are making a fortune on. So I think, you know, retailers, whether it's e or, uh, you know, e-commerce providers, there's no reason to be paying that kind of fee to, for debit cards. And uh, most governments that have value added taxes are have forced digitization because they want to collect their VAT. <laughs> so, you know, in Asia, a lot of it is under the table. And, you know, it, there's a restaurant, I go to a Chinese restaurant down the street where they only take cash. <laughs> so obviously, if they had to be digitized and pay with a smartphone, guess what? There'd be a lot more sales tax to whatever state you're in. So I think, I don't know how fast that's gonna to come to the US because I suspect the banks will block it. I am working, just a, a shout out, there's a, a group called Trustly that I'm involved in. I'm not an investor, I'm an advisor to them. They're a Finnish uh, tech company that does cashless in uh, Northern Europe. And they're in the US and trying to grow, but they cannot get the the commissions down to 20 or 30 cents because of the banking rules, but they're still 40% cheaper than using a debit card. But the problem is you have to get the consumer to want to accept the app on the smartphone. And that involves retailers kind of forcing the consumer to do it, 
like Costco forces you to use a Visa rather than MasterCard or whatever. The question is how many you know, merchants can force retailers to do that. But I see that as the next big thing. But I'm, I think regulation and Congress is standing in the way of what's been existing in Asia for or in Northern Europe for five years or more. So that's mm -hmm. one thing. The second thing is sapping up the excess capacity, as I mentioned, with platforms that match producers with distributors with retailer consumer. This, mm -hmm. To sap up a lot of the excess capacity that's out there, whether it's clothing, food, whatever. I think those are two huge opportunities. Yeah, and it also goes to decentralized finance or DeFi, which we have spoken about a number of times here as well on VCTV, that this can power the future and on the back office or the back end, that, that plumbing for the future of retail on all sides uh, and enterprises as a whole to that uh, to that point, uh, Joel, as well. And so, Gary, I'd like to come to you for closing thoughts. Anything else you'd like to share with the audience as to what's happening and what's reshaping the consumer and commerce landscape over the next decade? And then, of course, where everyone can find you online to continue the conversation. Well, you know, over the last year, we've had dramatic ch shifts in our behavior due to the COVID crisis. And now with the next wave of this thing, the contagious wave of this thing coming on, you know, we've been forced to buy things online. So where there's dramatically impacted the the uh, e-commerce that's been done over the last year. So I'm really happy in one sense that the digital transformation is upon us and we've been able to move so quickly and adapt. I'm concerned about the supply chain. What we still have don't have the transparency in the supply chain worldwide to be able to understand exactly what's happening, what place. We need to do a better job with that. So I think it's exciting times. The startups that are out there, go forward, you know, take your technology, especially with artificial intelligence, especially in e-commerce, and figure out ways that you can really optimize, streamline, and hyper-personalize the experience. Those companies are going to win this incredible opportunity that's out in front of us today. You can reach me, Gary Fowler, on LinkedIn, or you can reach me on Twitter, Gary Fowler. Love to hear from you. Stay happy, stay positive, and go get them. Thank you very much, Gary. Joel, same question to you. Closing thoughts uh, for the audience tuning in today. And then also, where can you be found online to continue yeah. the conversation? Well, I agree with Gary. I think there are exciting times. I think the, the main issue is with zero to negative interest rates, too much money is being invested in similar tech platforms where there may be a hundred different ordering systems or a hundred different delivery, last mile delivery or whatever. And there's going to be a lot of money lost, but out of those hundreds of platforms, a few will survive and prosper and make somebody a lot of money. So I think it is exciting times clearly. And I'm, I'm focused in the areas that I know the best from a consumer or, or, you know, retail standpoint and stay away from things I don't understand all that well like blockchain, for example. So um, I'm reachable on LinkedIn at Joel Silverstein, East West Hospitality Group. That's the easiest way to find me and happy to talk to anybody. Um, the, other, the only final point I'll make is emerging markets, people should not underestimate them because even in Nigeria and Kenya and Vietnam, in some areas, they're more sophisticated than they are in the United States. It's a great point, Joel. Thank you to you and Gary for sharing your thoughts and insights today. Really appreciate it. There's a lot to be had here in the e-commerce space. A lot of opportunity as we've talked about, whether it be around data, streaming, new platforms, connecting the dots between commerce and consumers. There's a ton of opportunity for those that are listening in that are looking to build and or invest. So get ready for an exciting decade and head in front of us. And with that, a big thank you to you, our audience for tuning in. If you like what you heard, click subscribe, make sure to share the episode and also check out the archive on latoken.com and to hear from more investors at the VCTV family, including Gary and Joel on different technologies, industries and regions around the world as they share their in on the ground insights with you on the latest and greatest happening in these areas so that you're up to date to make your next bet or uh, for you uh, entrepreneurs looking to build your next company as well. And with that, a big thank you to the LaToken team and to Maria and Hasmic for making VCTV possible every single day. And if you'd like to be on a show like today, reach out to the team and or myself and we will find the right spot for you. I'm your host, Kyle Ellicott. You can find me along with our speakers and guests today online everywhere at Kyle Ellicott on all social media platforms. We look forward to seeing you back here tomorrow with more VCTV. Everyone have a great day. Bye -bye. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye, guys.